The company that gave us insight into hybrid technology is now going mainstream. That's this week on Motoring 2002. TSN's Motoring 2002 is brought to you by Quaker State Motor Oils, formulated for the vehicles you drive and the way you drive them. And Midas, keep a good thing going. Go Midas! Now, a couple of weeks ago, we were checking out Honda's new sport utility, the Pilot, and somebody mentioned that it seems everything this company touches turns to gold. They know what the market wants, and reliability and quality is never an issue. But you know, there is one vehicle that has escaped the company's Midas touch, and that's the Honda Insight, the gasoline electric hybrid. Despite getting 80 miles to the gallon and being environmentally friendly, the Insight, along with the Toyota Prius, has never really turned the public on. But you know, Honda has not given up. They're now taking that same hybrid system and putting it in a vehicle that for many North Americans is as familiar and as comfortable as an old pair of sneakers. When Honda introduced the Insight, the company was hoping its funky, in-your-face style would appeal to a younger market. Well, we had the vehicle in our long-term fleet, and reaction from that younger crowd was indeed positive. But the price tag for a two-seater was obviously a little steep. Well, this time, Honda is playing it safe. And they're equipping the hybrid system in the Civic, the car that hit North American shores way back in 1972. The Insight certainly made a statement that uh, we could produce a vehicle that was an everyday drivable vehicle that could achieve 88 miles per gallon. Now what we're seeing is applying that same technology but in uh, mainstream production vehicles. And right now, of course, it's the Civic Hybrid. Tomorrow we may see vehicles like the CRV or the Honda Accord or even in a, a performance vehicle. So the technology now has been proven that it works and it can be applied in virtually any product. Everybody wants to have a cleaner environment, but the, the, the only problem is nobody wants to pay for it. So who's going to pay for it? People, uh, that's maybe, maybe the lacking point of the Prius and even the insight on that matter. It was too expensive and people would say, okay, what difference I will make by driving a Prius or an insight or a new Civic Hybrid? It's a vehicle that operates with gasoline engine as its primary power source. And then upon demand, whether it's uh, under heavy acceleration going up a hill, there's an electric motor that provides additional power in many ways like a turbo or supercharger might be. So it, again, is operating primarily with gasoline power, gasoline engine, but with an electric motor for additional assist. The vehicle drives marvelously well like a Civic. It, it, it's transparent. We don't, you don't know the system is there and it works. The only moment you feel something different is when you slow down. You don't have as much engine braking as you would with a regular Civic because of the system that cuts out the in, uh, three cylinders in some instances. The idea is to change your driving behavior if you count on engine braking. But apart from that, you basically don't see any difference. Oh, and it's also silent when you stop at red lights. As long as you keep your, your foot on the brake, there's no more sound, nothing, nothing running. The engine shuts off, yeah. It's fun. <laughs> but that fun comes at a premium when you compare the hybrid Civic to the Civic LX. Although there is a premium, this is a, an upscale Civic in many ways, and there's a lot of other features that are unique to it. The interior in the Civic Hybrid is unique to this vehicle with up-level seats. It has automatic climate control. It has electric steering or steer by wire. It has a continuously variable transmission, whereas in our Civic LX would be the standard four-speed automatic. It has alloy wheels and a host of other features. Um, so it really becomes the luxury Civic in that regard. 
people will maybe look at this kind of technology another way now. Uh, when you look at an Insight or uh, even a Prius, you think that this car comes from Mars uh, or even somewhere else, you know, uh, not from the planet Earth. So with the Civic, it will blend with the others and people will now feel that, you know, a hybrid vehicle does work and can work and it can work also uh, during the winter time. Plus, it gives both Honda and Toyota the prestige of offering something very special, a unique vehicle, the hybrid, something no other manufacturer offers at this point. Right now, for this first year, we're looking at uh, a thousand units here in Canada. Again, uh, the market demand will, uh, something it's hard to gauge with this type of product. And I think we may be pleasantly surprised at the uh, Canadian response. And as we move forward, Again, you're going to see more and more of these vehicles on the road, and uh, I think this is something we're going to see becoming more accepted in the years to come. Whine, moan, complain. I say, pump it up! That's coming up later on Kenzie's Corner. In the beginning, Saturn had but one car, albeit offered in a couple of different models. Then came the mid-sized sedan and wagon. This week, we take a look at the view, or Saturn's take on what an SUV should be. As is becoming increasingly more common, the view is offered in both front and all-wheel drive versions. The drawback with the former is that it only comes with a rather wheezy 143 horsepower four-banger. <laughs> The much better route, therefore, is the 3.0-litre V6. It bumps the power production to 181 ponies and a very worthwhile 195 pounds-feet of torque at 4,000 RPM. This brings an enthusiastic launch, strong mid-range and good passing power. It is also smooth and relatively quiet as it dishes out the thump. Now, part of the reason is down to the 5-speed automatic box. First gear is abnormally low. On road, this means a quick launch. It also lends itself well for those minor off-road excursions. Second, third, fourth and fifth are all spaced to keep the engine on the boil, which reinforces its work ethic. As with the other Saturn models, this view is built a little differently. All the side panels, well, they're made of plastic, which makes them a little more dent and ding resistant. Then you get to the flat panels. The hood, the roof and the tailgate are all made of steel. Now beneath this skin is a skeletal space frame that ties the lock together. The result is a safety cage that works as well as just about anything out there in spite of its rather unconventional design. The all-wheel drive system is again of the soft road variety as it does not have a low range gear set. That said, its on-road performance is up to class standards, even if that does mean it's not proactive. As is common, the system only drives the front wheels under normal circumstances. In order to power the rear wheels, the fronts must slip to initiate the transfer. While it does remain reasonably seamless in operation, you do know when the thing is doing its work. Inside, the view has been well thought through for the most part. Access to all the seats is easy, the seats themselves are comfortable, and everything else falls readily to hand. Even the view down the road, well, it's better than you expect. However, as much as they like the plastic on the outside, they love it on the inside. It's everywhere. The door panels, the dash, the center console, even the armrests on the seats are made of plastic. Unfortunately, it's not of the rich variety. The view rides on McPherson struts up front and a multi-link design in back with roll bars at both ends. The whole lot is skewed very much towards the ride side of the spectrum. This means that body roll is evident during transition and when pushed through the pylons, understeer became an issue. However, considering the view station in life, neither is too much of a concern. Likewise, while the steering has a reasonable on-center feel, it tends to be overly assisted most of the time, parking accepted. The rear end of this vehicle, and I apologize for this now, gets a mixed review. To begin with, 
The glass doesn't open, which is a bit of a disadvantage, but then again, you do get a real handle. Inside, it's quite positive. You get plenty of space, 30 cubic feet with the seats up and 63.5 when they're both folded down. The drawback is that the seats do not fold flat. Then you get to this rather flimsy contraption. Once it's up, it's not too bad, and it's designed to keep items from sliding around when you stop, start, break, corner, and do the rest of it. But then you get to this rather silly warning. It tells you that it will not keep it in place during a crash. No kidding. Stopping power comes from a front disc rear drum design. The pedal feel is crisp and the stop short and easily modulated. However, if you want the safety of anti-lock, something that should be standard considering this vehicle's price, well, you'll have to shell out another 750 bucks. Sadly, there is no polite way of saying that this is a disgrace, so I will. Elsewhere, the view gets the bare basics in terms of safety equipment, namely front airbags. If you want side curtain airbags, well, you'll have to get that old wallet out once again. You know, as a soft roader, this new Saturn view is a fairly good vehicle, at least from a mechanical perspective. What I'm not sure about is the use of plastics. As they're employed on the outside of the vehicle, well, that's very clever. As they're used on the interior, well, it's just not up to the standard set in this very competitive class. Our Midas Tip of the Week concerns fuel octane selection and trailer towing. We've got an email here from a viewer wanting to know if he should up his fuel selection to premium fuel when using his GMC pickup as a tow vehicle. Now most modern vehicles like the GMC pickup are designed to run just fine on low octane, 87 octane regular fuel. However, trailer towing imp imposes a little bit more load as you can well imagine. Now, most modern engines, like the GMC trucks and many others, incorporate a sensor into the engine that we refer to as the knock sensor. The knock sensor listens for the damaging effect of knock or ping, or spark knock as we describe it, and it adjusts the timing or retards the timing until that damaging sound goes away. Now, if you up the octane a little bit, let's say go up to 89 octane, you may find that you've got a little bit more power and a little bit better fuel economy when you're towing your trailer. I use my GMC pickup frequently for towing and I find that it works just fine most of the year. In other words, when it's cool on 87 octane fuel or when I'm towing a light duty trailer. However, when the outside temperature is really high or I'm towing something really heavy, I get better power and better fuel economy when I go up one step to 89 octane. You don't have to necessarily go all the way to premium, which is 91 or higher octane. In some fuel manufacturers, 93 or 94 octane is available. On most modern engines, you'll find just going up one stage to 89 gives you the performance that you're looking for. That's your Midas tip of the week. Well, what our purpose is is to uh, show our customers, the people that we call on every week and that we do business with, um, all the product line that we have. For example, uh, we have on display here about uh, 30,000 different items that we sell. But on the individual distributor's truck, uh, he probably carries about 2,000. So the customer doesn't really get to see um, all the products that we have. Everything that people take for granted in our business, somebody has to work to fix it or put it together or take it apart and put it back together again. So obviously the tools are all here that we have, uh, people can have a selection of things. We start out with a level entry toolbox, that would be $1,000 that an apprentice would buy or a fellow just starting in a business. If he's got a few tools then uh, he would go to the next level which is about a $2,000 price point and then they go up in, in size uh, and, and colors and quality. The days of the, the technician, the greasy guy in the coveralls and uh, the old little gray uh, Sears toolbox sitting in the corner, they're gone forever. 
we uh, offer to what we like to consider as our preferred customers because uh, it's an invitation only type of thing and uh, they participate as well as Mac on the uh, on, on lowering the price uh, to a discounted thing for people to come in and take advantage of a sale. They're Mac tools, you don't really look at the price. It is a bonus, but they work the best. Just a footnote to that story, Mac Tool says that they have toolboxes worth $15,000 each, and they're empty. They don't even throw in a screwdriver. It makes you wonder if our Bill Gardner in the Quaker State Garage just might have one of those toolboxes lying around in his shop. How about it, Bill? No, Brad, you know, much as I'd like to have one of those Megabuck toolboxes, when it comes right down to it, I'd rather put the money into the tools that go into the box than the box itself. And you know what? Those toolboxes are so well made that uh, you, you don't have to have any reservations about buying a used one. As a matter of fact, this upper portion of my toolbox I bought in, uh, when I was fresh out of high school for 50 bucks. It was new, but it was scratched and dented, and it's still working just fine today because I looked after it. Just like any piece of equipment or tool that you buy, if you use it right and take care of it, it'll last you indefinitely. And when you talk about the tools themselves, over the years I've acquired tools from all the major manufacturers like Mac, Snap-on, Proto, and the Canadian manufacturer Gray. The neat thing about buying Pro Quality tools is that they're usually lifetime warrantied against defects and breakage. So if you've got a Gray socket or a Gray wrench or a Mac or Snap-on wrench and it breaks on you, you just turn it back to the rep. You usually don't even have to show proof of purchase. If it's got their name on it and you didn't modify it, they'll replace it indefinitely. So it kind of justifies the high price of some of those Pro Quality tools. For the average do-it-yourselfer, you can probably acquire a little bit cheaper tools and do, do just a fine job when you're working on your own car. One thing about working on your own car, we often get uh, viewers email coming in wanting to know about shampooing or cleaning the engine compartment, looking after the engine bay of your car. And people of course think that clean is good and in a lot of cases uh, that grime and grease and grit that you see on the engine won't really cause a problem. It may look awful but sometimes if you don't know how to clean it off properly you can do more harm than good trying to get it off there in the wrong fashion. So that's what we want to talk about this week. Now a lot of people seem to want to use steam cleaners which in, of course involves hot high pressure water blasting in there and that is awful risky on modern cars because of the electronic components involved. You can drive moisture into some of these sensors and some of the wiring of the car that where it would never find its way under normal circumstances by using those high pressure machines. What you really should do is have your mechanic do this operation for you for a couple of reasons. First of all, someone like myself or professional mechanic that you get your car serviced by is going to know what parts need to be covered, removed, protected, or avoided. The second part is they're also going to know how to affect this operation without damaging the environment because the, the rinse ate that comes off that engine of course is pretty, pretty bad stuff and you don't want to wash it down the drain. If we do it inside our shop, it can be collected in the grease trap and emptied out without going down the drain. So that's really what you should do. However, if you want to do the job yourself, you can buy the same aerosol degreasers that we use in the shop at your auto parts store and they'll make life a lot easier. I happen to like this foaming engine cleaner the best. It seems to work about the best to me. You spray it on a cold or cool engine, allow it to sit five to 10 minutes, Use a stiff bristle brush if there's any heavy deposits. Usually give it a second spray, let it loosen all those deposits up, and then hose them off with low pressure, cool or cold water is all you need to use. Once you've used the degreaser, the uh, grime is gonna rinse off there quite easily. Remember that coating of grime that's on your engine kinda acts like a fur coat and, and makes the engine oil temperature run considerably hotter than it should be. So getting it off there, if you've got a lot of deposits, getting them off there, can really dramatically reduce the engine oil operating temperature. Till next week, I'm Bill Gardner for Motoring 2002. like Canada has a new national sport. Instead of hockey, it's complaining about gasoline prices. The CAA appears to be on the verge of organizing a protest march to Ottawa. The politicians are complaining about the gasoline companies. I say give me a break. You got company presidents making $3 million a year laying off 4,000 working people to raise the value of their stock options, and you're complaining about gasoline? 
Now, I know I told you this story a couple of years ago, but it's worth retelling. I saw a woman paying for her gas in a self-serve, and she bought a half a liter of Evian water. Now, at the time, gasoline was about 65 cents a liter. She paid a dollar and a half for half a liter of water. Some guy in France turned on his tap for three seconds. They ship it across the ocean, like we don't have any water in Canada. And she's complaining about the price of gasoline? No wonder Evian spelled backwards is naive. Well, Canada actually has cheap gasoline by international standards. It only looks expensive because we're right next to the United States. And of course, they're living in a dream world down there. Now, if they just took the price that they pay for their military and applied it to the cost of gasoline, it would be a different story. I mean, you think the Americans would have spent 87 quadrillion dollars bombing Iraq back into the Stone Age if Kuwait grew Brussels sprouts? I don't think so. And even as it is, the price of gas is starting to creep up in the States. And I saw a news report the other day they were interviewing people who were filling up their Exxon Valdez sport utility vehicles, and they were whining about the fact that it cost them $100 a week to ferry their kids to soccer practice. Now, wait a minute. If the price of gas goes up, and they get rid of their sport use and get into passenger cars, I say raise those prices. I'm Jim Kenzie. On a beautiful day like today, you know, there are very few of us that wouldn't do our part to help protect the environment. But as we've seen, environmentally friendly cars like the Toyota Prius and the Honda Insight have not been big sellers. Well, now that Honda has the hybrid system in the Honda Civic, one of North America's most popular vehicles, maybe now people will take a second look. But you know, in fairness to consumers, these vehicles do cost a little more. And unlike the United States, there are very few tax incentives in this country to help entice people to lay down some money. And you know, while some do, it'd be nice to see some more government agencies equipping their fleet vehicles with this kind of technology, leading by example. Not a bad idea. Well, that's it for now. We'll see you next time out as we continue to bring you more stories about cars and the people who drive them. They had the desire and the will to succeed. And I think that last part was probably one of the main reasons that I was attracted to them, was that uh, they wanted to succeed and they knew how to do it. TSN's Motoring 2002 has been brought to you by Quaker State Motor Oils, formulated for the vehicles you drive and the way you drive them. And Midas, keep a good thing going. Go Midas!